Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to the Table, where we discuss issues of the connection between God and culture. And our topic today is cultural engagement on a global scale. And my guest and expert is Dr. Scott Cunningham, who literally uh, trots around the globe um, working with seminaries and helping them to do what they do in the various contexts in which they function. Scott, I'll let you begin by just telling us a little bit about your background in terms of missionary work and then and then what you're doing currently. Good, Daryl. Well, thanks for having me. I don't claim to be an expert in this area, maybe some experience, and I'd be happy to share that with uh, you and uh, those who might be listening. But uh, my missionary career began about 30 years ago uh, in Africa, and we were attached to a seminary there in Nigeria where we had the privilege of of uh, shaping the skills and the lives of those who were going to serve the Nigerian church. Uh, we were there for 12 years, uh, had a wonderful uh, experience there, 12 wonderful years of uh, working with uh, Nigerian church leaders. For a- another dozen or so years after that, uh, we worked with an association called ACTI, and ACTI is the, associ- the Accrediting Council for Theological Education in Africa. That's why we call it ACTI, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But, but uh, that uh, opportunity gave me uh, the uh, privilege of building on the work I'd done in one seminary to work with seminaries across Africa. Now, how many seminaries were connected, more or less, uh, in, in Africa? We had 30 seminaries that were accredited, but probably another 70 or so that we had association with, mm-hmm. so uh, in various degrees of affiliation with them. Uh, and that allowed me the privilege of, of sort of building into theological education, leadership development across Africa. Now, for people who have no idea what accreditation is about, why don't you, uh, in as brief and as exciting a way as you can, explain what accreditation is. Yeah. Some schools, uh, or or most people here in the States would be familiar with accreditation at the university level, for instance. Uh, They'd want to be sure that uh, if they're spending uh, time and money investing in their training, they, they want a school that's accredited. And accreditation in the U.S. means that the Department of Education or uh, some association, a professional association, would accredit a seminary. Basically say that it's offering education at an appropriate level for the degree that it's offering and thus gives yeah. value to the degree that is conferred. Yeah, and it's actually accomplishing what it's setting out to accomplish. Mm-hmm. So a school is saying they're, they're setting out to train uh, those who are going to be pastoring in churches in the U.S. Uh, are they actually accomplishing that? So you, you, you measure the and, and evaluate, assess the school relative to its mission or purpose. So not only are we talking about a degree, but we're talking about whether or not they're attaining the objectives of education that they set for themselves in terms of the preparation. Yeah, exactly. So it's those two, those two ideas, the, the idea of the mission of the school or the purpose of the school and the idea of the academic level that's uh, being, uh, being offered. Okay, now if I've done the math correctly, and if I'm remembering correctly, you've taken care of 24 of 30 years, so that leaves a remainder. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, and again, that time of accreditation, that that work with schools in Africa, uh, was was a wonderful experience. Uh, our kids, so we had three boys. They all grew up in uh, Nigeria mm-hmm. during those years, and then returned to the states. And there appeared to be a time in our lives, uh, my wife Beth and I, when we were thinking, you know, where's God going to leave us, uh, lead us to next? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, sort of laid the cards on the table and asked God to uh, direct us. And just about that time, an organization called Overseas Council approached us and asked us to work with them. And uh, and we thought, okay, this might be a, a door that God's opening. Uh, let's uh, pray about this and explore it. Uh, and it was actually a wonderful opportunity, and that's the organization that I work with now, uh, Overseas Council, and have been for the past five years. The reason that this was such a, to me, intriguing and, and positive uh, way that God was leading was because I had invested my life in uh, theological education and the training of those mm-hmm. who would be serving the church around the world, in Africa specifically. Overseas Council uh, does that around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's their focus is leadership development. 
and so they partner with uh, around 80 different seminaries around the world. Uh, and as you said, helping them to become more effective, uh, helping them to uh, to make sure that their their mission, their purpose is uh, is appropriate for their context, and then helping them to to uh, reach that purpose to accomplish what they've set out to do in terms of leadership development for the churches that they uh, serve in. Yeah, my involvement with them goes back to my involvement with Lausanne and many people who I came in contact with Hmm. uh, through Lausanne Cape Town uh, 2010 um, have been touched by that particular organization and all the work that it's doing in seminaries around the world. Well, that gives us some sense of context. So today, you travel literally around the globe helping seminaries assess what it is they're attempting to do? Is that basically what you're doing, taking your accreditation skills, if you will, and applying them to various schools yeah. around the world? Yeah, my, my skills from being involved directly in one seminary in Nigeria and teaching, administration, and then with accreditation, having that broader look of uh, institutional development capacity in Africa, and then uh, now working with schools around the world. So what I have the privilege of doing is gathering together the, the leadership teams of these different seminaries, the presidents and deans and board members, and, and talking about issues of uh, their mission and how to do that more effectively. Okay. Now, I imagine there aren't too many people – I can think of one, uh, Manfred Cole, but uh, who have done the kind of global – uh, swath that you've done with that kind of an of, of an emphasis. Uh, so uh, you may have denied having expertise, but you certainly have a lot of experience that is um, in many ways unique in thinking about what we're going to be talking about, which is cultural engagement mm. on a global level. So as you look at seminaries globally, let's start off with this question. How are seminaries globally – and it's one of these great generic universe questions, but I'll let you go wherever you want with it. How are seminaries in most of the rest of the world like and unlike seminaries here in the West, particularly in the States? It's mm-hmm. a great question. I think I'll start with the like uh, mm-hmm. part. You know, uh, seminaries are sort of a unique kind of animal uh, in the sense that what they're doing is they've got one foot in the life of the church. And they have one foot in the life of, you might say, academia, mm-hmm. uh, in the life of, of schools or, or the university's higher education. Mm-hmm. And so there's sort of a hybrid uh, kind of institution. Uh, so that's the like part. Uh, both of them have those same roots uh, and, and convictions and, and purposes. Uh, there's that side, which is serving the church, uh, which, which has the, the whole reason of existence as being uh, serving the church through leadership development. But on the other side, there's that uh, component of what we're doing in a seminary that realizes that there's that cognitive development, that uh, learning the word and studying uh, the, the, the word and, and the traditions of, uh, of Christianity and, uh, and, and how we engage with culture as Christians to think Christianly and to do that from an academic framework. Uh, and that's where the accreditation part comes in a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but, but the merger, the hybrid of those two uh, fundamental purposes in the seminary is what's common. So whether we're in a seminary like Dallas Seminary uh, here in the U.S., or whether we go to a seminary like uh, South Asia Institute of Advanced Christian Studies, SIAX, in Bangalore, India, Mm -hmm. uh, you see that similarity, that commonality. So they're they're institutions that have both a foot in the church and in uh, in academia. But the the differences can be – I know that some – schools, particularly overseas, because education is so fundamental to some of the cultures, um, really <clears throat> have a broader um, goal or scope in terms of what they do. Some of them have become not just seminaries, but almost universities in the way they go about doing what they're doing. Now, does your work spill into those kinds mm-hmm. of institutions? And that would certainly be different than most seminaries here. Yeah, it would be, but but let's not uh, let's remember that here in the U.S., for instance, we've got a whole uh, genre of schools that are we call liberal arts uh, or, or Christian, or Christian liberal arts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And schools like a Wheaton, uh, a 
exactly. for instance, uh, and seminaries that are often connected with those, mm-hmm. uh, like Biola and Talbot, right? Uh, like at Gordon or uh, or, or Trinity. Uh, so they've got that liberal arts component uh, connected to it, uh, or a fuller that has branched out into psychology and counseling, mm-hmm. as well as world missions and, and theology. Mm-hmm. So there's already that impetus uh, mm-hmm. that you see in the States. It looks a bit different in the States because of the Christian college movement uh, and, and liberal arts, and whereas in, uh, in, in overseas contexts, we don't have the infrastructure uh, to have a separate university or separate uh, College of Liberal Arts, mm-hmm. uh, Christian College of Liberal Arts, and so those are often combined. Uh, and so what we see overseas, and this is happening in several places, primarily in Africa mm-hmm. and also in, in some parts in Asia, but primarily in Africa where there's uh, the impetus to, to realize, with the realization that there's no opportunities uh, for Christians who want to develop in areas of Social engagement mm-hmm. uh, in areas of, of government, or or even in uh, in just their their chosen field of uh, of their career, to get to learn those things from a Christian point of view, and so seminaries now are beginning to offer more and more uh, courses and programs uh, that we might here in the states think of as a Christian liberal arts uh, kind of track. So um, let's talk about that a little bit. What kinds of courses would be offered in those kinds of schools and those kinds of contexts that either you might see in a liberal arts situation or you even perhaps might not see in a liberal arts situation because of yeah. the nature of the context in which people are operating? Yeah, I think your last phrase is, is so important because of the nature of the context in which they're operating. So these schools, as, as they reflect on their mission and as they're thinking about uh, what's the best way to form Christian leaders for the churches that we serve? They often realize that it's not simply the uh, the pastors and, and evangelists and church planters that are needed by the church, but the church also needs people who are going to be engaged in the society in whatever career, whether they're going to be teachers, whether they're going to be doctors or lawyers, uh, whether they're going to be businessmen. Uh, and how then can that school prepare those Christians also to live and, and think Christianly? Uh, and so they are branching into those areas. Now, you ask for specific areas, and, and that would depend a lot on the context. Uh, there are some exciting programs, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, mm-hmm. uh, which, as you know, has experienced uh, uh, a tremendous conflict in that eastern part, the Great Lakes uh, region. Uh, and, and led to a lot of, of poverty, for instance. Uh, well, it could be the other way around. Some of the poverty has led to that conflict. <laughs> yeah. But for whatever purposes, uh, the, the school, one school in particular, I'm thinking about the, the uh, school in Bunya, uh, northeast Congo, a wonderful seminary, uh, began, I don't know how many years ago, but, but it began just offering specific theological, biblical degrees. Uh, And then over the past five years has developed a range of programs. One of those is in agriculture and community development. Hmm. You think, yeah, okay. Yeah, right. (laughs) I'm not quite sure. You haven't offered that at Dallas. That's right. Uh, (laughs) But what's happening is they're simply responding to that contextual need and with a recognition that that these uh, uh, churches that they serve have a desperate need for simply learning how to do how to take care of those basic economic needs as in agriculture. So they develop a a fishery program, an agriculture program uh, there at the seminary. And it's it's not – it's integrated in the sense that they're learning that from a Christian point of view, uh, but obviously it requires other skills uh, on the part of teachers, other programs. So they're fishers of fish and fishers of – They are, exactly. (laughs) That's the connection. Uh, So – other schools are doing things in business, uh, in uh, in uh, teacher training, uh, in uh, computer science, uh, things of that nature. So uh, you look at education overseas, and you you see this this scope of what's being covered. Um, let, let me ask you this kind of a question. Obviously, you spent a lot of time. Uh, outside the West, but you were educated here, so you understand both systems. What do you see happening overseas that you don't see happening here that you find um, interesting or intriguing, something that that we might learn from in terms of how uh, 
seminary education is taking place overseas and the way they're engaging is taking place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question also. Uh, I, I don't think there's so much that's not happening here in the States where you see overseas, but perhaps overseas we're seeing it more in an accelerated or an accentuated way that we don't see it quite so much here. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of that has to do with with uh, uh, simply the economics of what's happening overseas. You know, we don't have overseas in Africa or Asia, Latin America, we don't have the resources uh, that are done here. So here in the states, there can be a, an institution like Dallas Seminary that has a, a a very strong emphasis on what we would think of as a residential program, although we, we are now branching mm-hmm. out into non-residential programs through distance education. Uh, and and it's, it's sustainable in that sense. Uh, the, the school's sustainable as an economic uh, force, as a, uh, in terms of its mission and purpose. Uh, that's an effective, uh, viable uh, purpose that we accomplish here. And there's a lot of seminaries like that here in the States. Uh, overseas, what's happening is there are increasing economic pressures uh, to where that traditional, uh, what we think of as residential seminary, where students are leaving their place of work or ministry uh, and coming to study for two or three or four years, uh, that may not be viable for many places uh, overseas. And in fact, I would say most places overseas. Hmm. And so what we have is a situation in Latin America and in Europe and in Eurasia, the, the Russian-speaking world, in many parts of Asia, where there are more non-traditional students, more part-time students or distance education students, students that, that come into the seminary for two weeks at a time, three times a year, for instance, uh, students that are studying in extension sites, students that are studying through distance education. In fact, I can only think of one or two seminaries, evangelical seminaries in Latin America, where there are more traditional students than non-traditional students. That's amazing. You know, I was I taught in India several, well, about this time of the year, uh, several years ago, I guess three years ago now, and that was what was done: is students would come in for a week or two for yeah. one or two classes. One of them walked all the way from. Oh, I don't remember if they were coming from Myanmar or whatever, somewhere next to India, yeah. and, and and came a long way in an arduous thirty-six hour journey to get to the to get to the class. He was there for one week, and then he goes back and and yeah. uh, ministers in his context. And so, it's a way of doing education so that people can continue to minister and have the impact locally where they are. Isn't that part of the rationale? For it, it is. Yeah. So I mentioned the economic side yeah. of it, and the other side of it is in terms of effectiveness. Right. Uh, so it's it's both of these forces that are being combined uh, so that uh, they're not leaving their ministry. They're not being simply prepared for ministry. They're being prepared in ministry. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so they can come for two weeks at a time, for instance. Uh, They can do distance education. They can study where they are in extension sites and so forth while they retain their ministries. And so they're they're immediately putting into practice uh, those things that they're learning. Uh, and of course, they're not being separated from their families, which is often the case mm-hmm. when schools, when when they have traditional school setting overseas, they often right. leave their families. Uh, so there are a lot of advantages uh, to uh, to that situation. Uh, another obstacle or barrier or or disadvantage of the traditional educational setup in uh, uh, when it's in the overseas context is that school that students would often leave their their context, uh, oftentimes a rural context. Mm -hmm. They come into the city where the seminary is, they grow used to that city life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Their children are plugged into schools, uh, their wife gets a job uh, in the city. It's hard for them then to go back into that rural context where they don't have those same amenities. Right. And so uh, the traditional school setting actually extracts them Mm -hmm. from that context, and it's difficult to go back. You know, we have the same problem oftentimes with international students who come here who get so used to life in the West and what they're used to and what their kids have grown up with that going back is hard. It's a similar – it's the same kind of problem. And and so – and the solution oftentimes is the same, too, and and that is how can we do a better job of – educating them, of forming them within their own context without extracting them. So that's another advantage of that sort of distance education. Uh, 
So you, you began with a, a larger question, and that right. is what can we in the West learn from what's happening overseas? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is one of the main areas where uh, where where leadership development has has been shaped by the context, by response to the context, in a way that's effective, in a way that's sustainable, in a way that provides greater access uh, to people who need that kind of, of education. And, and can now benefit from it from out without a traditional uh, residential setting. Uh, and so all of those things, in Latin America I mentioned, uh, in, in the Russian-speaking world, that would be another place where I can think of, of maybe just a, a less than a handful of schools that, that still have more traditional students and non-traditional students. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asia is moving that way as well, although you still have – uh, strong traditional schools in India, for instance, some strong schools in Africa, but uh, gradually, I think we see in uh, in seminaries that that's the move that decentralization move is happening. Uh, it is happening in the states, and it's it's accelerating, mm-hmm. uh, and and that's exciting to see uh, because it is providing that kind of effectiveness and and access that uh, traditional schools sometimes don't offer. Uh, the church at large. So when you say non-traditional, we're talking primarily about programs in where someone comes into a campus for a short period of time, or is there are there uh, complete distance learning setups? Because those are two very different kinds of teaching environments. They are, and and we see a multitude. It's, it'd be hard to even enumerate all the different variations on the theme. Uh, so that's why I would just say non-traditional. Right. It's not the typical residential seminary. So, but distance education, where it's being done through internet or through correspondence courses, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, programs in the Middle East uh, is a program that does completely by correspondence. And there, of course, you've got other pressures uh, because you don't really want or can't have an institution in a in a strongly Muslim area. I was gonna. I was. I'm getting ready to go there. So just keep going. Yeah. So <clears throat> so that's another reason why those non traditional uh, um, programs of theological education are are effective and sustainable in those kind of regions. Because one of the issues that comes up in countries where if you're you're either from a country that's hev- heavily Oriented with religious restriction, I'll say it that way. Yeah. Uh, or, or, or your teaching in that context is the moment you go to the internet, you also make yourself susceptible to, to being watched. That's right. To put it simply, um, so uh, what? What are the challenges involved there? That's not certainly something we generally don't think about here. If we do, yeah. we minimize the risk that's involved because of the freedoms that we possess. So, so how does that work? That's right. So, so again, what we're thinking of is non-traditional uh, systems of leadership development, and in particular, what do you do in areas where, as you said, there are are either government restrictions or cultural restrictions uh, on what we'd think of as a traditional setting. Uh, you, you can't have a, uh, a seminary, uh, as we think of it, in Uzbekistan, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, uh, or in Algeria, uh, another place where, where the gospel actually is growing, where the church is growing, and yet we have to do something different in terms of leadership development. Uh, I mentioned the, the correspondence courses that are happening. Sometimes those don't happen through the internet, uh, but they would happen through the old, what we call theological education by extension, where, where students are given materials to work through, program materials, program texts, and then they meet together uh, periodically to discuss uh, what they're learning. There's a facilitator there who helps uh, uh, lead them in discussion mm. and, and understanding what they're learning and applying what they're learning in their own contexts. There are other programs where uh, I can think of one country in Central Asia uh, where where uh, students would come three times a week, or three times a year rather, for one week hmm. uh, to one place uh, in the country. Uh, and it's all very much underground. It's not like, you know, they're ringing the bell or <laughs> uh, announcing there's no uh-huh. sign on the door, uh-huh. you know, that says. No Facebook page. Yeah, no Facebook page. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and all that is, is taking place uh, in an unseen way. 
Uh, but there are leaders there, there are, are facilitators and teachers who themselves have perhaps studied in different areas. In fact, this is a fascinating story, uh, Daryl. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, think of this country that is a former Soviet Union country, mm -hmm. uh, which means that they had Russian mm -hmm. as a common language. And so they're able to go uh, from Central Asia to Moscow mm -hmm. to study in an evangelical seminary mm -hmm. in Moscow or an evangelical seminary in Moldova, mm -hmm. you're saying, you know, what, what's the common thing here? Mm -hmm. Well, it's Russian, mm -hmm. uh, that, that those courses are being taught in Russian. They can go there, the visa issue is not a problem for them. Uh, they can go there, study, and then come back and, and train uh, other leaders within their churches mm -hmm. in a, a, not a seminary context, not a traditional setting, but in house training. So all there is is a house, mm -hmm. uh, and they're coming three times a year to that house for one week at a time uh, using uh, material that is all being translated from usually Russian hmm. into their own language, uh, printed, which by the way is, would be illegal, mm -hmm. uh, or, or using a flash drive or something to put that material on so those students can study the Word of God and study become more effective in leading those house churches that they're responsible for. That's happening right now. Wow. Uh, you know, when we think of seminary or leadership development in the U.S., we have one particular box uh, that we usually think of. This is the way leadership development happens. But uh, as you and I know, mm -hmm. that's not always the way it happens, mm -hmm. and not always the way it can happen best uh, in overseas contexts. So we sort of have to go up out of the box. Uh, think of that those non-traditional things that are being developed in countries like in Central Asia and North Africa uh, where, uh, where we don't have that luxury, as it were, of a traditional uh, setting. So this role of these facilitators is important because one of the complaints that you get when you move from a traditional to a non-traditional model is you lose the modeling. At least that's, that's what's right. claimed. That's right. What's claimed is you don't have the student faculty relationships. You don't have the one on one time that you get with students. Although I think it's fair to observe for many of us who teach here that what's happened with residency today is generally speaking, you don't have students who live on campus, or if they do, they're in and out, they're working, et cetera. So you're not getting as much time with the students as you used to in the past. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, the complaint is is that you don't. The non-traditional model can't replace the kind of personal discipleship elements mm -hmm. that go in. But it sounds like what's happening in the overseas models is is that there are people being placed in locations to play that role alongside the school, oftentimes, or as a part of the school, to make sure that that dimension is there. Am I getting that right? I think that's right. And, and uh, in a lot of these settings, uh, we think of them as traditional cultures. Uh, rather than modern or postmodern, more mm -hmm. traditional cultures, in which that face-to-face -face time, those relationships are so vital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we could talk about the difference between a more traditional culture and, and a, a culture more uh, what we think of here in the U.S. or in the West. Uh, but but church leaders recognize that they're not going to be able to grow as believers without that that constant interaction, mm -hmm. that relationship, mm -hmm. as you said, the modeling and the mm -hmm. mentoring and the discipleship, uh, so that even though you might have Skype, for instance, and, and, and see each other over the internet and mm -hmm. talk with each other over the internet, there's, there's nothing that compares uh, to those vital relationships that only happen on that one-on-one, -on -one, face to face level. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they're developing programs where that is a component, even if it's only for several times a year. Uh, that there's still that essential component of that face-to-face -face time that provides that modeling and mentoring. Um, it, it, it's certainly hard. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, e even gathering together as a church to worship every week is difficult in some settings. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's the desire. That's their ideal, and that's mm -hmm. what they're moving uh, that's the kind of thing they're doing. Well, let, let's transition here a little bit because we've talked a little bit about leadership development, what's going on in seminaries around the world. I want to do that. But I also want to talk about issues that relate directly to cultural engagement. When you And, of course, you live here now, so you understand 
and have grew up here, so you understand life in the West. And again, part of what I'm trying to help people see and why I wanted to have you in is to help people see the different ways in which things can happen. Right. Um, and obviously, cultural context drives a lot of what does happen. But how is cultural engagement – it's a question like I asked about the seminaries – like and unlike what happens here? Um, are there similarities? Are there differences? What do, what does that look like? Yeah, I I think a lot of it is going to depend on whether you're thinking of a situation where Christians are the majority mm -hmm. or Christians are a minority. Now I think that is an extremely important point. So I'm just go ahead and go yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in in situations where Christians are a majority or there's a a, a Christian a, a culture that is uh, that is heavily influenced by Christian thinking or, or a Christian heritage, mm -hmm. Christian values. And we think of the West mm -hmm. uh, primarily as being that. So even though you may not say in, in Europe, for instance, that you've got a, a strong Christian majority, uh, there is that, that Christian heritage, uh, and, uh, and certainly, of course, in North America. And again, you might dispute uh, whether evangelical Christians, for instance, you know, what their numbers are, the proportion are. Uh, but certainly there's that Christian influence within the society. That situation is contrasted with situations, for instance, in India, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the Christian population is small in number. There's a Hindu culture. It's not a strong Christian culture. And, and the, the way that the church perceives itself and the way that the church perceives how it engages with the culture around it would be very different, I think. Uh, now, there are going to be some commonalities, and so we can talk about the similarities and the mm -hmm. differences, but I think that that, uh, that we have to distinguish areas in which Christianity already has a strong element in the culture versus those where it's not. And, so, and maybe a culture that's kind of in between, I don't know, or, or but still in the same vote like much of the West, it would be a place like Latin America where you have a strong – um, Catholic and Christian undercurrent or that moves through the culture that makes it different than, say, many cultures in Asia or mm -hmm. or in uh, uh, in Africa. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, what's the African situation like when it comes to this question in terms of Christian versus non-Christian influence? What goes on there? Yeah, it's going to be different within each country. Right. Again, uh, thinking along the same criteria, mm -hmm. but North Africa, which of course is more Muslim, mm -hmm. is going to be different than a, a South African country, for instance, or, or West Africa, where there's a strong Christian influence and has been for the past well, 50 years probably. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.